All aboard! For this stagecoach is about to move out! It is for everyone that has potential and would love to be a superstar. Yeah, buddy, this stagecoach is leaving for Fun Timesville. And the Lord God is your driver to see that we have a safe trip. Holla! Friday nights at 12.30, 9.30 on Saturday morning. All aboard! All aboard! All aboard! All aboard. Say, look ahead! AC, if you've got Comcast C2, tune in every Friday night at 12.30 and again Saturday morning at 9.30 for the AC Funtime Television Show. If you have talent and would love to be on the show, contact Arthur Chisholm, 843-200-4487 or Elder Carlingtown, 843-735-2189. Look here, are you having an event, gospel or R&B? Need a band, a DJ or videographer? Contact Arthur Chisholm, Facebook. Or Elder Carlingtown on Facebook. Please subscribe to AC Funtime TV on YouTube. AC Funtime, Comcast C2. 1230 Friday night, 930 Saturday morning. Be there. 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 Be you know why I'm here today? Because I love you. You know why Pastor Dixon and all these people are doing what they're doing? Because we love you. Now, we leave you in love at the end of the day, but we will have a continuance for another meeting. So with that, I greet you in love. Let's move forward with the program. God bless you. Most folks that know me know I'm not one for protocol that much. I, I have a hard time following the standard protocols. Amen. Representative Wendell, Wendell Villar will attest to that, that sometimes I just overlook protocols in order to sometimes get down to the business at hand. Mm -hmm. But I do want to take a minute right now to acknowledge certain people that are here. So before I go any farther, I just want to make sure that we acknowledge in the House our State Representative Robert Brown. Okay. Representative of this district. Okay. We also have a representative from Congressman Mark Sanford's office in the House today. Ms. Lauren Turner, is it? Yes, let's help you a hand, too. I definitely would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge our partners in this thing. And I will tell anyone, our partners in what we do are the members of law enforcement, our esteemed the Deputy Chief Tony Elder, Sergeant Trevor Shader and all the other officers here who introduced himself earlier and talked to me earlier and I have to admit I'm embarrassed to say I've forgotten your name. <laughs> there are also members I do believe of SLED here, someone from SLED is here, is that right? Yes. Yes, yes, we have a SLED representative in the house. Excellent, excellent. Anyone from Charleston County? Charleston County, in the house, I'm sorry. And, and I knew our victim's advocate in the house this evening, the Roach, and also Lieutenant Dan. We are here for you. This is not for any show. This is not for fashion. We are really here for you and know that you can call on us at any time if you need us. About two weeks ago, Shannon Maxwell sent me a message and she said, in the process of what you have going on at the community center, do not forget Melinda Ford. Melinda Ford was shot and killed on Johns Island in her yard, and I believe in the presence of her children. And so at this time, we would like for Shannon, along with the family members that's here, of Melinda Ford to come up. This is my family, Peterson, Glover, Laborde, and we all stand together as a family. We all know who God is. We all know we love God and he loves us despite of our faults. But how many of us have actually called their brother or sister or niece or nephew just to say, I love you today? Every day. <laughs> just, just today. She may have, but the third, one, two, three person probably have not. And no one knows that you love them unless you tell them. Amen. Domestic violence. Shooting, homicide comes in all shape, fashion, and size. It doesn't matter. These people right here and the Holy Spirit and a lot of you all out there has kept us 
the Peterson, Labor, Goff, and Frazier family together these last two weeks. Amen. And I just thank God for y'all. The only thing I ask is you show more unconditional agape love, as my mama would say. Despite the fact of somebody may not have a nice outfit like I do. If they are on the corner, give them a hug anyway. I love you. And God loves you too. That's how we get to the next step. Sure, the young boys out here doing whatever they're doing. And to, please don't take this wrong, men. Y'all have to step up. Yes. Men have to step up. I'm going to keep things going. Um, I did want to add a couple of things onto what I heard over the last few minutes. And one in particular is with a. I know that uh, Miss Danielle said as far as uh, my brother's keeper and stuff like that, you know, and I always think about these things a lot. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I don't want somebody keeping me who ain't got their act together. You know what I'm saying? You know, we got to look in the mirror and make sure our stuff is in order. You know, how are you going to help somebody else and you just out of order and out of control? Our overcoming power comes from the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimonies. The next young lady I'm going to bring up, and first off, I, I'm going to apologize because we are totally out of our time, right? Totally. But we're going to let it do what it do. Amen. The next young lady I'd like to call to the microphone, though, we've been working along with her for a while. She's an author, a mother, an amazing individual. That's the least I can say about this young lady. But in 1991, her world was literally turned upside down by a situation that not only did she hear about, but she witnessed. So I'm going to call to the mic my close friend and partner in the struggle, Ms. Danielle Richardson. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I must say, this is the best community meeting I've ever been to. And I've spoke over dozens and dozens and dozens. But the presence to see the whole Walmart Law, John Zala family here, I am impressed and I love it. Um, First thing I would like to see to the family of the bar and God's family, I keep you in your prayers. Amen. I know too well what you're going through and how you feel. And I can't say that your pain is going to be over in a day or a week or two or years. Because like in 1991, June 18th, 1991. I was a child living in a domestic violence household from the time I was four until the time I was 16. I saw my mom beaten, put guns to her head, and ultimately I was in a struggle trying to save her life after I stepped in, stabbed her 37 times. Where she lost her life in that, in that battle, but it wasn't a few days later, he can't take the pain that what he had done, and he ended his life. Mm -hmm. So my brothers and I, we lost a parent, both parents, within a matter of three weeks. That left us in a world where we knew nothing on how to survive. But before my mom left this world, she taught me one main <coughs> important thing that I always should live by, and that was faith and to believe in God. And at that time, that was the only thing that I had was my spirit, faith in the Lord. And for over many years, I went through depression, different mental illness, suffering from PTSD, and been on every type of nerve medicine that they could possibly could give me that described by a doctor. But nothing, no medicine of no kind could ever take away the sight and the pain that I felt from witnessing my mother die. You know, as a child, you know, you don't supposed to become the protector of your parents. But for me, being the oldest in my family, that was my role. 
to be protected, to make sure everyone was all right. And they felt that I had failed because I let my mom die. Even though it was just a child and it was not out of my control. But as I got older and I realized once I got into church that I only could do what I could do at that time. But the Lord had prepared me to be able to do a bigger and better mission. And that was to be able to stand here before you all, not just to tell you my testimony, but to let you know that domestic violence is not a private family matter. Amen. It is, it's not a private family matter when you walking outside your doors and you have bruises and you can't see and you have to keep telling lies upon lies and saying that, well, this happened, or I fell down the stairs, or I broke my ankle. That's not a private family matter anymore because people are seeing. They know it was happening. But as a community, I ask and stand in front of you, when you see those things, don't brush it off as being a family, a private family matter, or that just going on in so-and-so house. Because what goes on in so-and-so house is going on in your community. And when you don't speak on it, when you don't talk about it, you don't recognize it, or you don't be there for that person, when that deadly day comes, it's not only going to look bad for that family, but it looks bad for that community. You know, everybody wants to know, well, well, where was so-and-so when that was happening? Oh, ain't nobody know that this was happening to that person. But everybody knew. Everybody just didn't to choose to see nothing. Because when my mom was going through what she was going through, we love among a lot of people. A lot of people knew what was going on. But they choose to say, well, that's their business. We ain't going to worry about it. Now, if these days are time when we got a state that's number one in the nation, we have, what, 50 states? Yeah. And South Carolina is number one in domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So that means out of every five women, these three of them being beaten. Mm -hmm. At least one of them going to get killed. At least the other one going to have children who are sitting there witnessing yeah. their death their struggle, their life, and then that child is going to grow up thinking they will. I seen my grandmama getting beaten. I seen my mama getting beaten. Because it's okay for me to get beat because that's how he loves me. And we can't have that. Not only that, we have to teach our children how to love one another inside our household so they can learn how to love each other when they get outside the household. We got to make sure that this is the way the love of life has got to love, love all the time. You know, if you see somebody next door and they're going through stuff, and you see they, their children going through it, because you know the children going through it if the mama and the daddy going through it. Sometimes you might can't get to the mama and the daddy, but the children, they always looking for an outlet. They're always looking for somebody to talk to. So I know when I was in school, there was plenty of times that I cried upon my friends and close family members, like I can't go home. I walk around downtown, up and down King Street and Meeting Street all day long until the next time to come home because I didn't want to go face what I have to face at night. So just imagine in your community, kids who walking back and forth in the neighborhoods in the dark because they don't want to go home because they don't want to face what's going on. And that is the time when you see that, don't ignore it. You go to them, you ask them what kind of help you can. You know, some people you can might face, you know, and say, hey, I know you're being abused, let me help you. Because a lot of time when people are in that situation, they don't, not saying that they don't want your help. They just don't want to be ashamed. But that don't mean turn your back on them just because they, you can't get to them and you can't reach them at that time. But now, today, that they have people like my sister's house, Real Mag. Project Unity, different organizations that have ways of privately helping people. And those times, my mama didn't have those outlets. And for me to be able to stand here and to be able to talk, I feel good that I'm helping save my mama once again every time I try to save one of you all. Right. Yeah. 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 To be able to take the initiative as a community, when you leave here today, that I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. I am my grandmother's keeper. I am my next door's keeper. Because 
What happens to me happens to the whole community. Right. What happens to you happens to the whole community. Right now, it's, it's um, February, and since August of last year, we had 22 people murdered from domestic violence. Mm. Some were men, women, and some were children. Some, right now, they got the crazy mess going on with tax money. The people killing their whole family over a tax refund. Mm. Over a few thousand dollars that going to be spent in a month. Yep. Children are, are being taken out of this world. Yep. We got to do better. Now, I've been in the fight over these last few years and months we've been going through with going back and forth to Columbia, fighting to get some of these domestic violence laws to be able to change. And right now we got the bow number three that's out. And we have some senators that feel saying, well, we need guns. We got the right to carry guns. So we gonna carry guns if we want to carry guns and if you know, somebody get killed, hey, that's our second amendment right. But if you got abusers out here who already been in jail for CDV constantly, do you allow them to have to keep carrying the same guns that you know that they're going to use to kill their spouse? Well, we're trying to get that law to change, and we need to each and every one of y'all to start calling into the senators and into, the, into Columbia and emailing them so they can vote to be able to pass these laws so they can take the, cans, the guns out of the hands of these abusers. But also, we want to be able to help you. We need our advocates. They need better equipment and things so they can be able to help these domestic violence victims. Because a lot of times we have shelters and we have a lot of community outlets where they can go at. But a lot of times a lot of people are afraid of getting turned down because of certain things. So they don't think they have enough money to be able to get out of this situation. But they are help out here and we got to make sure that we are known and be available to say that, hey, we are here to help you. Amen. You don't have to go through this alone. Amen. So when you, when you see my sister house or Real Mad or Project Unity or any one of these groups, they coming out here and they, they're speaking or you see they having something to go and support them because they are here to be able to help you. Yeah. Not all of them are victims, but there are people who are saying that they are, they are tired. So basically, back in the day, was it took a village to raise a child. Ain't too much villages going on no more. One time before, when I used to get in trouble, the neighbor beat you, yeah. Yeah. your mama beat you, yeah. your daddy beat you, yeah. auntie, uncle, everybody yeah. beat you, right? So now it's like, I don't want nobody to say nothing to my child. Don't say nothing to this, don't say nothing to that. No, we got to do better than that. Try and tell you. It's getting to the point that we are losing our kids. But I want to start off by saying this. I don't know nobody in this room who's been to heaven. He came back and told me there is one. But I'm going to make preparation for heaven and get there and find out whether it is or not them not be ready for heaven and get there and find out there is one. That's me. Now, this is the distinguished panel up here. I'm the young one of the panel. And you see the subject they gave me to talk about. It wasn't because they said we need someone to speak. They gave me this panel to talk about this because this is what I lived for so long. I lived in that life. I was a part of that life. Call me Papa Smurf. And there's a reason why I asked them to do that. Because behind that name is a history. Y'all might not know it, but y'all might have heard of it. I was involved in one of the biggest drug deals here in Charleston, South Carolina. I got arrested with Henry, Henry Judy Benny in Hughes, South Carolina. What happened to me during that process was I couldn't tell. I might have lost my life. But a distinguished gentleman who's not here no more that the police force might know about, named Mickey Watley. He was a uh, lieutenant for SLED. And at that time, the FBI and SLED came and got me. They wanted to pull me out the cell and talk to me. And I said, I'm not coming out here to talk to y'all. You know, everybody see me talking to y'all, they don't think I'm telling. <laughs> no, I ain't talking to y'all. And the weirdest thing about it was, that ain't why they pulled me out the cell. They pulled me out the cell because Mickey told me, I think I can help you. I said, well, how can you help me, Mickey? Only thing you want me to do for you is tell them somebody. No, you can't help me. 
But as a result of Mickey Watley, who ended up working with SLED, he was in North Charleston, I think he was at County too, chief or whatever, I don't know his, what he had, his titles. The man saved my life. Literally saved my life. What he did for me was he gave me a mirror to look in. He didn't give me a story about, well, if you do this, you're going to end up in jail. If you do that, you're going to end up in jail. He gave me a mirror and said, look at yourself. And that's what I did. I looked at myself. Now, I knew I couldn't just get away with what I did. I knew I had to go to prison, and I went. And I went for a good little time. But through prison, I studied. I started to read books. And one of the biggest things I found out in the books, and I hope I don't offend nobody, because I'm from Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. I ain't over this side here. <laughs> so I ain't gonna stop no trouble because it's a long way to get back to Mount Pleasant. <laughs> but let me tell you, I found out one of the biggest lies that started my transformation. And that was when they told me the white man was the devil. I said, oh my God. Oh my God, all these years I went believing that. That all oh, this white man is holding me down. All oh, this white man, this all oh, this white man. And I'm a history buff. I study history a lot. I know it down pat. It's nothing you can bring up in history that I don't know about. Because I spent 73 months studying it in prison, over five years studying history. But when I start to realize that these Caucasian people, is that another way to say it? <laughs> no, my light-skinned brothers, I'll say that. My light-skinned brothers was not my enemy. I said, well, what else have y'all been lying to me about? I said, if these guys, if Mickey Watley can come to jail simply because he sees something in me, I was told on. And I was this low man on the totem pole. They told him on me. They tried to push everything on me. But I manned up to it and I stood and I said, here I go again being proved that this whole thing I've been taught, told all my life is a lie. There's no honor among thieves. There's no honor. The, the boat has sunk. The shark is eating him. Why should I go back and try to save him? I'm swimming for myself. So they put me up and they said, Smurf did it. That's why I came here today. I came here to talk to not the older people, well, I'm going to say something to y'all too, but to the younger brothers that constantly hear this word snitch. Y'all hear it. Ah, oh, don't snitch. Don't snitch. You know who started that? We did. We stopped. That was a way to intimidate y'all. Because who could best tell me about the drugs I was cooking than the person who was sitting there cooking it with me? The police wasn't there. They wasn't there when I was doing it. They don't know what happened, but they do. So now I got to make sure. I'm just using that again. Now I got to make sure she don't tell. If you tell, you snitch it. If you tell, you snitch it. So I went on and on and on. So I started to realize that got out of control. You know, it really got out of control. Because any man who commits a crime, listen to me now, an act that is wrong, it goes against the dignity, I would normally say state, but I'm gonna say water law. That goes against the dignity of water law needs not walk the street. Period. If he can kill somebody, he shouldn't be left to kill another one. And if anyone of y'all in here can stop that, you just prevented your son from getting killed, yours from getting killed. And the weirdest thing about it, because many of y'all might not have been there, I've been there, is once we get in them cells, we start to realize it. But it's too late. We have 35 years with the new um, non parolable fence. The, the uh, war on drugs, they no longer want to give parole for violent offenses. So if you get 30 years, you're going to do 28. 28 years. Well, I was fortunate again when the judge asked me if I had anything to say. And Lord, I got up there and talked. My legs were shaking because I knew how much time I was getting ready to get. But I realized that what I was faced with was a lie. And the same thing I'm standing before you today talking about is what I said in court. Your Honor, they told me not to snitch. But you see how many people came in here today and pointed the thing at me, Your Honor. And Judge Victor Wall said, yes, I understand. He said, I can't overlook what you did. I have to sentence you for accordingly to your crime. 30 years. No, oh, I said, Lord, how you think I need 30 years to straighten up? 30? 
No, Your Honor, not dirty. Not dirty. Not for them telling on me, and, and they got the bill run in. I had a public defender. She didn't do much for me, but she's bad. <laughs> now I'm getting ready to get 30 years? And all I broke down, the Victor Wall said to me, this is all in my transcript. You can go online and look it up. You were the only person in all the years, I forget how many years he told me he was on the bench, that ever came up here and talked about snitching. And because of that, I'm going to suspend your 30 years and give you five. And I looked at that judge, and all I could do, because I'm going to prison now, is smile. <laughs> but what I did after that, I smiled at him, I'm not gonna lie, I smiled. I turned around and looked at my mama, and I remember that old saying, boy, you got a praying grandmama. <laughs> As a result of that, I advocate that if any one of y'all believes snitching is wrong, you're wrong. Because if someone kills somebody out here in this community, and you let them go, all you've done is boost their ego. Yep. Now you're telling them, I can do it again. Yep. Yep. You let your video fool you. And we can't do that no more. We have to stop. We cannot allow our children to continuously die by our children. If you leave your gun home, and I leave my gun home, we both going home. And that's more important. I'm talking about that lie that we've heard for so long that got even mamas. You know that boy ain't got no job. And he coming in with the $300 speakers on. You know that boy ain't got no job. And he got a ride out in the back door with 26 inch work parked in your driveway. And you know he ain't got no job. But you turn your head because every month he slides you that $200 for the right there. So you act like you really know what he's doing. Don't get mad at me, Pastor. Let the people say amen. <laughs> but now that that son that you knew was doing what he was doing is dead, now all of a sudden you want everybody to tell. Oh, you seen something happen to my son. Why you ain't tell your son was bad? And then I'm gonna be like, oh Lord, I'm gonna tell you something. Pastor, you think we're gonna make it out here safe? Oh, I don't know. But then when he's in the casket, in front of the people, everybody get up and say, oh, he was a good boy. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling the truth, he wasn't good. He polluted our community. Yeah. I hate to see that he's dead, but had the mother stepped up, had the father stepped up, right. he wouldn't be where he's at. Right. No. He's made his bed, and now he's got a lady. Yeah. But it's no way, it's no possible way no Lord, stand up for me, little man. Yeah. There's no way that this man should die because none of y'all want to tell the criminal who's running around your community killing people. He deserves to live. He deserves to. He deserves a life, a chance to be something, somebody. Yes, come.